everyone doing? Yeah? Good, good, good. I want to welcome every single one of you guys to Greenhouse today. My name is Mike Patz. I'm one of the pastors around here. I invite you to take the Bible. Go to Psalm chapter 22. Stand up on your feet. I want to especially give a shout out to everybody that's down in Orlando right now. I've got some of you guys that are there. And uh, any of you that are in church online got to be with some of you guys for worship just now. And it was just good to be with you guys. And anywhere you're joining us, anywhere in the world, we're in a series called The Struggle is real. And today we're going to be looking at another place, another case study of this guy named David. Just so you know, next week we're going to be having special guests with us, Mark and Linda Hosfeld. And they're going to really be approaching this side of the struggle is real when it comes to fear. We're going to be in Psalm 27 next week talking about fear if you know someone that's in that kind of a boat. But specifically, they've given their lives to reach Muslims and to teach Muslims and to build uh, bridges with Muslims. So if you've got a heart for that, if you would like to know how to uh, even approach the, the re- relationship between Christianity, Islam, answering Islam, things like that, especially in non-condemning, non-religious, very loving and kind kind of ways. Next week, you're going to be with some people that just flat out love uh, the Muslim world. And if you're a woman by chance that has interest in this, we have a very limited amount of people. But any of you that are interested, we're going to have a, uh, like a breakfast, lunch kind of bre- brunch kind of thing going on next uh, Saturday morning. If you're interested in that, if you will text Andrea, she will uh, get you information on that breakfast and you could be a part of that, but it's just going to be good. So I can't wait for next week. But here we are. Psalm chapter 22 is where we're at. Today we're talking what it means to feel and be forgotten. So Psalm 22, if you're ready, say, let's do it. Psalm 22, to the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn. This would mean this is the song, that this is the, the tune, according to the tune of the doe of the dawn. Just so you know, the Psalms are actually songs which means it kind of matters because uh, this week I was listening to some different music. I'm a Star Wars fan. I don't know if you know, you're familiar with like the uh, uh, Darth Vader's uh, theme song. He's got a theme song to what he does. The Princess Leia, she's got a theme song. Uh, The Force, you know, has the theme song. The Star Wars starts off. I get a feeling that the song we're about to read is not to the tune of Call Me Maybe or I'm So Excited and I Just Can't Hide It. (laughs) Because these are the words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Now we're going to cover the whole psalm, but I'm just going to start it today with my God, my God, why? What do you do when you seem to have been forsaken by God? That's where we're going today. Let's pray. Father, we call out to you and ask that you'll do something in our midst that we could not do in natural power. I pray that in Auditorium A, right here at online in Orlando, anywhere where we are gathered, that you will bring your kingdom and that your will will be done, that you will open eyes in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Give someone a high five, have a seat, or smile at your screen right now if you're watching this down the road. And of course, this is a series by David about David. And the question is, what do you do when you're David and you feel pretty forsaken? You might remember that David had been crowned the king. He'd been crowned to be the next anointed king of Israel. And he intended to do that. And he did not ask for this. He wasn't campaigning for this. He wasn't running for an office for this. He just has the prophet come and crown him and say, you will be the next king. And the, the oil goes on his head. It's like, okay. So at that point, from that moment on, God has told him, you will be the king. So he starts to expect that he will be the king. He starts to dream probably about a palace and about a throne and about, uh, I don't know, crowns and about good days and good food and a good life. And, and all of that seems like it would be really good. But instead of experiencing all of the good life, God anoints him as king. And yet in between the anointing and the fulfillment of that promise, there is this length of time where David is is not just not becoming king right away. He's, in fact, uh, been a faithful soldier in the army of King Saul. You might remember he killed Goliath and set God's people free. And in response and giving of thanks to David for all that he has done, he is now perhaps on the run. He's been rejected. He's even being hunted by the very people that he has saved. If anybody knows what it's like to be forgotten or feel forsaken, David's got to know what that feeling is like. 
Now for you, maybe it's not a throne. For you, maybe it's not a palace. For you, maybe it's not a crown. For you, maybe it's, it's health. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he says, why are you so far from saving me? God, uh, God I, I sure thought you made it sound like my health was going to be better than this. I, I was sure dreaming of a promotion that was better than this. I was sure dreaming of a job that was better than this or a life that was better than this or, or a marriage that was better than this or I've seen a bunch of loser parents that are raising great kids and I'm an amazing parent. Look at my kids. You know, and Regardless of what your little situation is of what you expected and when God doesn't seem to be living up to your expectations. God, I studied. I sure thought I was going to nail this semester. God, I, I, I killed it. I sure thought I was going to get a scholarship. God, I, I just nailed it. I thought I was going to get into the grad school that I've always dreamed of getting into. God, wh why don't the companies I start work? Why can't I get my law practice off the ground? Why can't, well, why isn't my business working? Why, why don't we have financial security? My, my God, my God, why? When life doesn't turn out right, it's easy to get stuck in the first five words of this psalm. My God, my God, why? It's easy to get stuck there in the why and to not read the rest of the psalm. And it's easy when you are in that moment to feel forgotten. And when you feel forgotten, you start, you start to, to act like an orphan. You, you get desperate. And here's the problem. Desperate people do desperate things. Is this not true? When you're feeling forgotten, when you feel like an orphan as opposed to a son or a daughter. When, when you feel like that, you, you'll do things you wouldn't have done. Or orphans do things that sons don't do. And orphans do things that daughters don't do. And, and, and there's times when you get so desperate. At, at best, sometimes we'll, we'll just waste our life away. We take out our phone and we just kind of scroll through and we, and we social media binge, you know, or we, we Twitter binge, or we Facebook binge, or we Instagram binge, or we Snapchat binge, or we're binging on whatever, or we go Netflix binge for, you know, the next four straight days or whatever. You know, we're kind of, you know, catching up on, you know, old school 24 episodes or something, you know? You know, and someone's doing something like that. At, at worst, at, at best, we oftentimes just kind of waste our life away. At, at worst, we self-medicate. We, we medicate, medicate ourselves with maybe it's alcohol or maybe it's a drug or maybe it's a substance or maybe it's a, uh, the, 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 if I were just going by statistics, the number of us in this room, the number of us that are watching an auditorium A that are addicted to prescription meds, uh, we self-medicate with things like pornography. We self-medicate to go and, and say, okay, life isn't turning out like I thought. I might as well go ahead and. And here's the essence of the sermon today. Here's the whole sermon in a nutshell. When you think you're forgotten, you live like an orphan. But when you know you're forgiven, you live like a son. Listen, auditorium, when you think you're forgotten, when you think you're forsaken, you live like an orphan. You, you cast off restraint. You just do whatever, whatever. It's all random. But when you know that you're forgiven, you live like a daughter. You live like a son. You live like a child. And that's where we're going to go today. So we're in Psalm 22, and it's called a Psalm of, of Lament. Now, these psalms of lament, I know it's not real exciting. I told someone about this. They said, oh, great. That sounds great. You're going to preach about lamenting. The problem is we're in this series, and it's about David and these psalms of lament, and there are more psalms of lament than any other kind of psalm. I know it's kind of exciting to say, hey, let's have a, a psalm of rejoicing. There's more psalms of lament than any of the other kinds of psalms that are out there. third of the psalms are psalms of lament, and the psalms of lament have this process that they go through predictably. First, there is an address to God first. Number two, there is a complaint against God or to God. Number three, there is a plea. God, would you please do something about this? And then number four, there is an expression of faith. There's an address to God. There's a complaint to God. There's a plea to God. And there is faith in God. And that's where we're going to go today. So let's take number one. There's an address to God. Verse one, my God, my God, my God, my God. Now he, it's personal here. This isn't just a God, a God, or almighty God. This is my God, my God. So there's a personal approach to God. If you are going to get real about the struggles in your life and you want to be able to do something about it and get to sonship, not just orphanhood, you've got to stop complaining to the people who can't do anything about it. Let me say it again. Stop complaining to the people who cannot change the situation. That's very, very important. A guy was uh, talking to me recently, kind of complaining to me recently, and uh, he's you know, going on, Mike, man, and just complaining and complaining, kind of vomiting, you know, just vomiting, 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 you know? And, and I said, okay, great. I'll tell you what, let's stop and pray right now. Let's just stop praising, huh? I said, let's stop and pray right now. And he's like, ah, what do you mean? I was like, just like this. So I stopped. I said, Lord, um, I pray that you will listen to what he's about to say. Go. 
And he was like, uh, what do you want me to do, to pray? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I I wouldn't know what to say. I'm like, just tell him what you told me. He's like, you mean like pray? I said, yeah, like like pray. He said, well, I don't know. I said, just pray. He's like, okay. He said, uh, D- dear Lord, Father God, I, I just come to you and I, and I just, uh, Father God, I, I just thank you for this day. I'm like, no, stop, 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 stop. You didn't come to me and say, oh, dear Pastor Mike, I'm just so thankful for this day. Oh, dear Pastor Mike, oh, dear Pastor Mike, oh, dear pa- oh you, you are great. No, you, you didn't do it. You're just like, Mike, life stinketh. And that's cleaned up. But life, life isn't good. You just went straight at it. You went right at it just like that. I said, so why is it that when you're coming to God now, why are you coming? We said, well, the, the Bible tells us when we pray, pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy. I, I get that, and I get your King James, and I get your, but there's something about someone's, there's more than one prayer. In fact, the book of Psalms is like 150, just about 150 prayers. Here's David saying, my God, my God, why? Are you allowed to start like that? It's in the Bible. In fact, maybe some of you need to learn this prayer. When you pray, pray like this. My God, my God, why? Number one, there's an address. Number two, there's a complaint. He says, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, from the words of my groaning? You you, you can't read this like in a sterile environment. This isn't soft. Like it's almost embarrassing. It's almost awkward. David is intent. There's an intent. If you're kind of reading this, almost falling asleep, you're not reading it right because there's some, he's talking to God like I've been groaning. You've been doing nothing. Could I get an answer? Why? You ever felt like that? See, this is David's genius. David's genius in these psalms is that the psalms are raw and they're organic and they are real and they remove the masks. And what's amazing about David is that David just decides to go ahead and do it publicly. He puts pen to paper and he's like, this is, this is the, guy, the guy, by the way, that the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. If you're in auditorium A right now, I pray to God a bunch of you will take the mask off of your face and get real with God. When in a culture like ours where we're so prone to putting on a mask and, and we play games and we even play games with ourselves and we even play games with our God and David just doesn't. It's almost like David's like, bump that, forget that. And he just, he's real. See, see there's, in, in real relationships, there's conflict. Uh, we have a lot of young people in our church and a lot of times a young lady will come up to me and say, hey, Pastor Mike, uh, I want you to meet the guy that I think might be the one. I'm like, ooh, you know? I want you to see him. Oh, he's just so godly and so fine. And, and she'll describe him or whatever. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to meet him. And, and well, how long have you guys been together? Man, we've been together for six months. Oh, that's great. And, and I have a few, you know, go-to questions. You know, one of my questions is about purity, you know? And the girls usually like, oh, yes, I'm glad you're asking this. The guy's like, oh, gosh, you know? Uh, but then one of my other questions is, so have, have, you, guys, have you guys had any fights? And occasionally someone will say, no, we haven't fought at all. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Because if you've been in a relationship for six months and there's been no conflict, some people are like, does that mean we're compatible? That means you're probably wearing masks. That means you're probably not in the real world. That means you're probably dropping acid every time. When, no, you know what I'm saying. There's like, so if there's, see, see, see. What David says is that when you come to God, there's an address to God. There's a complaint. There's like, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? Why do I groan and you do nothing? About, why is my business falling apart? Why is my marriage falling apart? Why did you heal other people and you didn't heal me? Why, God? And there's this complaint that he brings. He takes the mask off and he's confronting God. It's almost like he's coming into God's presence. And if you read it and you're religious, you're offended by the first two verses of this psalm because religious people can't handle the candor and the honesty of King David. And yet he... He barges in. It's almost like he barges into the presence of God. It's almost like David approaches the throne of God like he's got access and like it's a throne of grace. How do you approach God? It's a throne of grace, he would say. See, see what I love about God is that a lot of us, when, when we're seeing this forgotten, when, when you think you're forgotten, there's all these questions. When you think you're forgotten, you live like an orphan. You live like an orphan. But when you know you're forgiven, when you know that you're forgiven, yet you're going to live like a son. And that's what we're talking about here is that there's this address to God. There's, a, there's an orphan spirit that I want out of you and out of me that when we come and we're like, well, when I come to God, when I'm praying, I should be here. Now, maybe you should be here, but this is what I love about God. God 
takes us where we are, not where we think we're supposed to be. This is such good news because if you're far from God, I keep meeting people all the time like, hey man, why don't you come to church with me? They're like, ah, I need to clean up my act first. I, before I go to church, this is where I should be. No, no, God wants you where you are. God will take you where you are because when you bring things to Jesus, they change. It's one of the ways of Jesus that things change when he gets a hold of them. So there's a, there's a complaint, there's, a, there's an address, but number three, there's a plea. And we see the plea in verse 11. He says, be not far from me. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. He's asking for help. Now, what I love about this is that he's making himself get clear. And I need you to see that when you're in a pit or when you're in a valley, sometimes that, that pit or that valley, it will help you crystallize what it is that you really want. If your business is doing terribly right now, sometimes there's something very beneficial about you having to whittle it down. Okay, what is it that you actually want? Or in your relationship, if your relationship's bad and you go get a counselor, sometimes the counselor will be wise just to say, what do you want in your marriage? Tell me. Paint the picture. What do you want for your kids? Tell me. Paint the picture. We had to talk this week as a family. We sat everyone down. We said, hey guys, we want the presence of God in our house. What does it need to look like? What would we need to do and what do we need to not do? What needs to be in our home? What needs to not be in our home if we want that sense of the presence of God in our home? There's a plea where he says, what, what is your plea? Down in verse 19, he goes on to say, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly. Can we try that prayer out, by the way? Those two words, come quickly. Say that with me. Come quickly. Lord, would you please hurry up? Are we allowed to pray that? Aren't we just supposed to pray? Pay? This is what I hear people pray. Lord, your timing is perfect. Thou art wonderful and wise in all of thy dealings. When thou art ready, we invite thee and beseech thee to come. I like how David prays, come quickly. When I'm driving down the street with my kids and they say, Daddy, can you stop? No, not right now. We're not. Near. Daddy, stop. I got to go potty. I'm like, okay, just wait a little bit. And then a little while, if you're a parent, you know how this goes. Daddy, yes. Got to go potty. No, I'm, okay, we're stopping. Soon. No, Daddy, quicker. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. We stop in the bushes, right? We stop, oh, pull over. <laughs> There's something about a child that makes their daddy know. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Would you please hurry this up? See, see, there's a process. I, I, I appreciate the fact, and we're going to land on faith. There's an address, there's a complaint, there's a plea, and then there's faith. But I feel like religious people are awful quick to try to jump people to the faith without walking people through the process. A lot of times we act like faith is a destination when there is a destination to faith. But is there? Because in a lot of ways, faith is a journey. In a lot of ways, faith is, it's a process. There is, there's a relational reality to faith. You don't just arrive. You might arrive at getting married. There is a moment. If you've never met Jesus, I pray today that you'll be pronounced a child of God. I pray that happens today. But once you become a child, you've got to learn how to live. And I don't want you to live like an orphan. And there's a process that we go through. And the stuff that real relationships are made of, it takes time. And the stuff that real marriage is made of, it takes time to get a great marriage. It takes time to get great relationships. It takes time to establish a great calling or a, or a great career or a great life. It's going to take some time. And that's what I love about this psalm. This psalm just kind of walks us through and it's real. What do you want? Are you ticked off today? What? Bring your ticked offedness to God. What do you want? Lord, restore my family, resurrect my career, heal my child, settle my mind, end my bondage, break this bondage I have to this addiction. Ask him. Look at me. Ask him. Some of you that have been so stuck, I will pray for you right now. Some of you are watching this down the line, down the road, online later on. In the name of Jesus, I am praying that you will be freed from your addictions. But there's something about when Jesus waits for you to ask. When he waits for you to say, Lord, will you set me free? Some of you in auditorium A, and you are just bound up in, in, in let's say it's lust or pornography in a way that, that it's going to affect your marriage 15 years from now. Ask him to make you free. Some of you that are so stuck in a depression, so stuck in a place of, God, I thought my mind would be more settled than this, and it's not. You have not been able to shake off that despondency, and you put on a religious mask, and today I'm praying that you'll take the mask off and that you're going to know. Listen, it's a process. I dare you to get past verse 1. My God, my God, why? And take the psalm all the way through. Some of you that are sitting here right now and you've got all these why, bring the why to God. Bring the plea to God. Bring the complaint to God. And then it ends on faith. He says in verse three, yet you are holy 
enthroned in the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and, and you delivered them. To you they cried and they were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. He brings back to remembrance, wait a minute, God, I've already seen this happen. You always come through. I was talking to one of the men in our church recently and he was just really, man, in a, in a bitter moment of life and, and it was just hard and I didn't have any good answers for him. He's like, man, Mike, I, other people seem blessed. I just don't feel blessed. I feel the opposite of blessed. And I started bringing to mind, I'm like, you know, man, I just, I just know that God comes through. I know that God's character is that he is good and that he comes through. And, he's, and we just kind of hung up. The next day he calls me back and he's like, Mike, after 20 years of walking with Jesus, I don't even know what I'm thinking here because when I'm in the middle of the pit, it feels like God's never going to come through. But when I looked in the rear view mirror, I remembered 20 straight years, God comes through every single time. How many of you can testify the fact that Jesus is faithful to come through? Now listen, if you're in the middle of a pit, I know sometimes it's hard. and You're like, Mike, I'm in the pit. I don't just need someone telling me everything's going to be okay. No, I know, but you do need someone reminding you of what David said in the middle of his complaint. He's like, Lord, yet you're holy. Our fathers trusted. To you they cried, and you came through. And I love this about him. There's, there's, there's a faith. There's a faith. Why? Because he, he says, you are holy. This is his character. This is who he is. I've got to remind you right now, I don't know what your earthly father did, but your heavenly father, he says, you are not forgotten. He says, yet, you are holy. You are not an orphan. You are a son. You are not an orphan. You are a daughter when you start to belong to Jesus. You belong to him, yet. And what he's banking on here is the character Character of God. What he's banking on is that there's something about God that's incredible. That's why my kids, they barge into my room at every hour of the night. My little, I've got eight kids and they'll barge in any old time they want. They barge in in the evening and they barge in in the morning. It could be two in the morning and my like, four-year-old doesn't say, oh, I bet mom and dad need some sleep. She just barges right in and they'll ask me for crazy amounts of things. They'll ask me for crazy petitions and they'll ask for all these things. Why? Because they're banking on my character that my proven character that who I am is a deposit in their souls of daddy's got what it takes to pull this off. So when my kids, if it's two o'clock in the middle of the morning and then two o'clock in the night and, and there they are, my kids will come in and I'll be trying to sleep and they will come and try to wiggle their way. Why? Because they are my children. They, they're not orphans. They're my kids. My children have access that the rest of the world doesn't have. So if it's three o'clock in the morning, my kids will come in there and wiggle their way into my bed. I'm like, what is going on? If Pastor Robbie texted me at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, Hey, Pastor Mike, I really need to snuggle right now. <laughs> it's only happened twice. <laughs> I'd say the struggle is real. I have a word from the Lord, Amanda, his wife. That's the word. See, see, the reason David is approaching God like this is because David knows he has access. David knows, he's speaking. I, I know he's complaining, but I'm telling you, this isn't the complaint of an orphan. These are the complaints of a son. See, when you think you're forgotten, you live like an orphan. You'll do whatever. Who, who cares about the rules? Who cares about what? But when you know you're forgiven, you start to live like a son. Because in the moment, in the valleys, when life is going crazy, you remember his character. Yet, you are holy. Holy means different. That means holy is he's distinct. He is separate. He's altogether other than. He's not like the boss that lets you down. He's not like the boss that didn't give you the promotion that he sort of suggested. What this means is that this God, this is the one that David comes to him and it's as if David says, God, you sure made it sound like you are a rock and you said that you are a refuge and you said that you are a fortress and you said that you are a redeemer and you said that you are a savior and you said that you are a deliverer. So I'm coming to you now and I'm going ahead and cashing that check because this is who you said you are. So I'm going to hold you to it and say, God, oh my God, my God, why? And I'm banking on the fact that you are a rock and you are a fortress and you are a deliverer and you are a redeemer. And I'm going to stand on that right now and say, I need you to be who you said you would be. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter did that with me. She's, she goes to, to NAVS and she reminded me. She said, you know, Daddy, you, you told me there's like a beach retreat coming up. And she said, you told me if I like want to go to stuff like that, that's, you know, for Jesus, <laughs> that you would pay for it. <laughs> that's what you said. Mike, what, what, what's the application of this sermon? Here it is. You, I want you to bring your stuff to Jesus. 
I want you to bring it to Jesus. Do you have a complaint? Bring it to Jesus. Do you have a plea? Bring it to Jesus. As a family, do you have questions? Bring your questions to Jesus. Everything you bring to Jesus changes. They had a, a wedding where they ran out of wine. All they had was water. They brought their water to Jesus and the water changed. A blind man brought his eyeballs to Jesus. His eyeballs changed. Lame people brought their bodies that didn't work to Jesus. Their bodies changed. A woman with an issue of blood, she walked up to Jesus with 12 years of blood flowing. She touched Jesus and her flow of blood changed. Jesus has a track record that everything he touches changes. It's a rule of the universe. It's a law of the universe. There is a law of the universe which is gravity. You drop things and they fall. There's another law that goes over all the other ones which is when you bring things to Jesus, they change. Just like the law of lift goes against the law of gravity and a plane can do this, the law that what you bring to God what you commit to God, what you consecrate to God. When you commit your works to the Lord, your thoughts are established. When you commit your job to God, things get established. When you bring your pleas to God, they change. When you bring your complaints to God, they change. When you bring your family to God, they commit your works to God. Commit your plain complaints to God. Auditorium A, call out to God today. And there's faith. That, that's why it's not enough to stop in verse one. My God, my God, why? I'm all for being real, but you gotta read the psalm to the end of the psalm. You, you gotta read the psalm all the way through. But Mike, you still not answer the question why. No, I know. My God, my God, why? Why, why, Mike? Why? Okay, I was in Pakistan, and when I was in Pakistan, uh, they had the best rugs. I went into this um, rug store where they sell these beautiful rugs, and I walked in, and there's you know rugs here, rugs there, rugs everywhere, and I walk up to this one very expensive rug, and I'm looking at it, and honestly, I just don't get it, and I realize I'm not the most artistic person. Many of you guys know, uh, like, you know, I'd rather have someone cut me with a knife than to sit through an entire musical, you know, so I'm not artsy in, in, in that sense. I'm, I don't have that, whatever that streak is, and I, I'm thankful God for all of you that do and uh, that's precious and everything but I was here at the rug store and, and I'm just looking at this rug and it's like the best rug and I'm looking and I'm just not getting it I'm like I wouldn't pay that I wouldn't go for that. I wouldn't do that. I'm looking at the rug, making no sense. The guy speaks Urdu. I speak English. Um, he's looking at me kind of like, what's the problem? And I'm just like, no, no, I, I have no interest at all. To which he's kind of, you know, going, you know, sort of signaling back to me. Are you sure? You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm, I have no interest. And he's like, wait, wait, come here. And he's looking at me. And as I'm looking, and it just looks ugly, he, he, comes, he says, could, could you come around here? You're looking at the wrong side. <laughs> and he finally turns me around. I look at the other side. And I'm like, oh, what looked so random and ugly and ridiculously overpriced was actually beautiful and precious and full of order. And my friend, if all you ever do is read verse one and two, if all you do with your life is get to the wise and you never get past that, and if you won't walk through this journey, what will happen is that you're going to be like an orphan. See, orphans, they think everything is random. When you think you're an orphan, everything feels random to you. And when, when all you are is the, the compilation of evolutionary processes that have led up until this point, and the universe is random, and you are random, and your family is random, then what's the point anyway? Because you might as well live like an orphan you're forgotten. Life doesn't mean much. But if there's actually something like order, if there is actually order to what's going on, if there is order, if there is beauty, if there is goodness, if these things are real, if God is indeed good, if that's what's really going on, then that changes things. Because when you're going through things, when you're looking at life and you're saying, my God, my God, why? Sometimes someone's got to remind you, go to the other side of the rug before you judge the masterpiece. And some of you are trying to live a life and you're looking at the wrong side of the rug. You're looking at the wrong side of the psalm. And so he comes. I remember years ago, I had just come on staff at this church and Pastor Lastinger was the pastor and his daughter-in-law daughter was 32 years old. I loved that family. I would go over and play with their kids. They had two daughters, Rachel and Sarah, and they called me Mr. Fun. We would play. They would get, you know, it's like, oh, I mean, after I would, we'd do all our things, I was like, man, I wonder, I want to have a bunch of kids like you guys, you know? And, and that was the seeds of where my family, I think, got started. But um, here I am and I love that family and I loved um, Alan the husband and Ginger, the wife, and at 32 years of age, Ginger tragically in her sleep passed away and died. And I remember how hard and how crushing this was. And I remember watching as people would come up and a lot of people want to jump straight to the faith. 
A lot of people want to jump straight. They want to, they want to avoid Psalm 22, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, all these parts. They want to jump straight to it. And I remember people would say things like, well, all things work together for good to those who love. And that's true, you know. And people would say things like, well, you know, God meant it for good. And that can be true. And, and people would go, well, count it all joy when you fall into various, and all those things can be true. But I remember when Pastor Lasting was walking through this, and he just felt it. And he would pray prayers like this. God, where were you when she died? God, what is up? What, how will this happen? And why would you let this happen? How do these things take? And someone could come and say, well, that was the devil. Don't attribute to God. What is it? You know, none of your cliches, none of the religious responses help when you're in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. And I remember pastor, and he would listen to people, and he was nice to them, but he would just go off, and he would, I remember him saying to me, Mike, I'm just, I'm just angry. Well, who are you angry at? He's like, I'm angry at God. I'm, I'm questioning God. I'm like, whoa, my pastor is questioning God, but I loved how real he was. And and he brought his complaint to God, and then he brought his pleas to God. And I got to tell you, by the time it was done, he landed at a place of faith and peace because he knew he was a son. And he knew that when I've got questions that do not have answers on them, when I'm feeling like I'm forgotten, that doesn't mean that's what the reality is. He showed me, Mike, you don't want to live a life looking at the wrong side of the rug. And man, I've got to tell you, years later now, that has so marked me as I've realized that this, this God that we have, he's got shoulders that are broad enough to handle our complaints. And by the way, if your God isn't big enough to handle your complaints, you need to get a bigger God. I'm not saying you stop at your complaints. You're going to take it all the way to faith. But you just can't. You can't. See, I've hit low. Look at this verse. One. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Why are you far from the words of my groaning? I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Down in verse 12, he goes on to say, Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. When the bulls of Bashan are coming against you, baby, you're in trouble. I'm not sure what a bull of Bashan is, but it's a bad thing, right? They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and a roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up. Have you ever been there? I'm just out of strength. You teenagers going nuts. You're like, God, I've got no more strength. Your marriage is going crazy. I've got no more strength. A sibling is suicidal. I've got no more strength. You've done all you know to do to pass and you, and you can't pass and you're like, what, what, uh, Lord, I've got, I've got no more strength. He says in verse 15, my, my tongue sticks to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of the earth. Sometimes there's a weight that seems intolerable. And what I'm just trying to tell you is take the psalm to the end. Because if you'll take the psalm to the end where you say, God, I address my God. I bring my complaint to God. I'll bring my plea to my God. What I can tell you is this. In the end, what you're going to do is you're going to find that you can find a place of trust like David does in verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. And in the midst of the congregation, I will will praise you. Can everyone just say praise the Lord? You who fear the Lord, praise him. This is good. You who fear the Lord, praise him. One of the reasons we need you even when you come to church, praise the Lord. Sometimes you're like, ah, I'm not in the mood. No, praise the Lord. Praise be the name of the Lord. You who fear him, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised, listen to this in faith, he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him but has heard when he cried to him. I don't know what you feel like right now but I'm promising you this. He has not forgotten you. He has not forsaken you. He will not forget you. He will not forsake you. He is not going to leave you. He will not. When you feel awfully forgotten and you reach those desperate places where you're about to go do some desperate things, where you're about to go break the law, where you're about to go break God's words, where you're about to go break covenant, where you're about to go break some things that you know shouldn't be broken, you need to remember this. You're looking at the wrong side of the rug. Remember the story of two best friends that went to war together, and while they were at war, um, one of them gets very wounded. He's out on the battlefield. The other one's back uh, with the rest of the battalion and um, he sees him. The guy cries out, calls his name and he sees him and he wants to go and, and to run to him but there's the, you know, the gunfire is going crazy and going nuts and, and uh, he just doesn't feel like he needs to go or should. You know, or, or the people are saying that he shouldn't but everything in him is like, man, I gotta go find my friend and, and finally he says, hey, can I go? And everyone's like, no, don't go. He's, he's, he's done for. He's lost cause at this point. And as soon as everyone turns aside, he 
he goes and he runs anyway through the fire, through the line of fire, through the battle waging all around him, raging all around him. He goes and he finds his friend. He picks him up and he starts to make his way back to the encampment. As he's going, the, a spray of gunfire just goes against them and it mortally wounds his friend in his arms and it wounds him as well. He makes it back injured to which his lieutenant looks at him and says, now look at this, what a waste. We told you not to go. He says, there was no waste because as soon as I picked him up, he looked me in the eyes and he said, I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. My friends, I'm telling you, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother and his name is Jesus. There is a Lord that's better than every other Lord, and his name is Jesus. There is a father who's more faithful than every other father, and his name is Jesus. There is a comforter who's more comforting than every other comforter, and his name is Jesus. There is a master who is better than every other master, and his name is Jesus. You have a friend and a redeemer and a, and a fortress and a strength in the one who is called Jesus. Can we just say his name? Jesus. And that's the one that David says, would, he has not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. 26, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. I'm giving you a promise. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. I don't know what affliction you're in. Read the psalm till the end because when God is the author of the story, the story always ends well. Maybe you're in the middle of the worst of chapters. I'm telling you, read it till the end. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. Man, I thought about this last week. I was out at, at UF at, the, at our final service of the week. And, and I'm sitting there. And it was right before service. And man, we've had a really difficult time in our family the last few years. And, and I'm sitting there like, man, God, what have, what have you been doing? And right before service was about to start, I'm just sitting there and I'm looking in into the auditorium at the university and all of a sudden I, I just had to get overwhelmed. And man, there's people from different nations coming together and there's people from different religions coming together and, and they're gathering together and here we are speaking Jesus and preaching Jesus and these words just slipped out of my mouth. I said, Jesus, if I had a hundred lives, I would give them all for this mission of lifting up your name from Gainesville to the nations. Because I sat there, and I'm like, man, should I have just done, there's been moments when I'm like, should I have done something else? Should I have gone somewhere else? I was like, man, if I had a hundred lives, I'd give them all to do exactly what I'm doing. A hundred of them. And I just got this smile on my face, saying, man, something's about to happen. At the end of that service that night, there was this guy from another nation, and he was there, and it was 30 minutes after the service was over, and he's just still sitting there. Just sitting there. And I'm like, so what's going on, you know? And, and he's just like, man, I'm just... I'm just thinking about, I'm just stunned by this thought. I said, well, which thought? He said, this idea of the pact of salvation. I'm like, I've never heard of someone called the pact of salvation. He said, that's what you were talking about tonight, right? The pact of salvation. I'm like, I guess you could call it that, you know? In Spanish, it's like un pacto, you know? Like, yeah, I guess it's like a covenant, it's a pact. And he was just sitting there almost trembling like, if this is true, this is worth my whole life. And I'm sitting there like, man, this is exactly what David says. All the ends of the earth will turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. See, when you get this, what happens is you realize God didn't just put you through pits just to get you out of a pit. He puts you through things that when you come out on the other side, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. There's mission here to this. Verse 28, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Man, can I just say, Jesus rules over your family. He rules over Gainesville. He rules over Orlando. He rules over the United States. He rules over the Middle East. Jesus rules, church. Auditory made, Jesus is in charge. He's sitting on the throne. And when you're in that moment looking at the wrong side of the rug, wondering, is Jesus asleep at the wheel? Can I just remind you, absolutely not. See, when you think you're forgotten, you live like an orphan. When you know you're forgiven, you live like a son. And this is where it ends, 29. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him. They bow, they get, go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness. Hear this. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness. Self-righteousness is where you try to put together a righteousness to come to God 
God. His righteousness is where he knows you couldn't. So he put together righteousness and gives it to you through Jesus. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. This is the difference between the righteousness of Jesus and all the others. All the other righteousnesses is where you're trying to do it. The righteousness of God is where he has done it. And church, I'm telling you, Jesus has done it. I'm going to say it again. Jesus has done it. Amen. But Mike, I feel forgotten. Well, let me just, let me, let me speak the forgottenness right out of you. Put Isaiah 49 up there for me. Isaiah 49. We're going to end it like this. In Isaiah 49, I love this promise where God says, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget. Now listen to these words, church. Yet, 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 I will not forget you. I will not forget you. I will not forget you. Daughters, I will not forget you. Sons, I will not forget you. I think about when Jesus was taken before Pontius Pilate. And by the way, this psalm gets on the map not because of David. It's because of David's greatest descendant, Jesus. Because when he's up on the cross, of course, one of his Good Friday sayings was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I wonder what he was thinking when he was being brought before Pontius Pilate and they take nails and they stick them in his hands and they pierce his skin for our sins. And I think about this verse 16 where it says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. I will not forget you. God, how can I know you won't forget me? It's almost like what could God do to give you the permanent reminder that you will never be forgotten? Because when you lose your job, you can be tempted to think you're forgotten. And when life is going bad, it, you, you can be awfully easy to think that you're forgotten. And when, when the guy dumps you, when your marriage falls apart, when your children reject you, it's awfully easy to feel pretty forgotten to live like an orphan. He says, yet I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. So eternal God becomes a temporal man. And Jesus comes to earth. And he goes and he gets his hands pierced. And Jesus dies for our sins. And Jesus is buried for our sins. And yet an interesting thing happens because on the third day he rises from the dead. And when this great son of David rises from the dead, when they say, is this really you? Are we just imagining things? He says, take a look at my hands. When they're wondering, when they're in their moments of doubt, what does he do? He lifts up the hand. Thomas says, I'm, I'm doubting. I, God, I'm doubting right now. If you have any Thomases right now, and if you're still doubting, I want you to look at the nail-scarred hands once again. Because he says, I have engraved you on my hands. You will never be forgotten. For all of eternity, I don't know how this works, but somehow 10,000 years from now, those hands will still have my engraving on them. The permanent mark of the love of God that you'll never be forgotten. That you will never be forsaken. Auditorium A, you will never be forsaken. And if you've never turned to him, I call you to turn to him today. If you've never responded to him, I call you to respond to him today. He's coming to you. And he's asking, will you receive my fatherhood? Will you receive my lordship? Will you receive my kingship? And maybe some of you up until this point, you've kind of been a believer in your brain, but a doubter in your heart. This is the day to say, Lord, I believe. Maybe you're watching online and you don't believe in Jesus. I was talking to a guy this week and, and as he was describing his life, I said, what's your story? He's like, man, I don't know. I, I, I went to church as a kid, never really believed. Our family didn't have much of God or whatever, but, but man, someone invited me to come here and I started coming and, and I started realizing you know, in my past, it was all about what you do to get right with God. And then all of a sudden here, I heard this thing about the, the grace of God, his righteousness, how he's done it, that he's done something that makes us right with him. And those nails were for me. And, and I just started to believe it. And next thing you know, I've been coming for about six months. And I'm like, whoa, snap. I believe this stuff. And my life's never been the same. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes someone meets Jesus and they know exactly the second that it happens. Sometimes they can't put their finger on when it happened. And just talk to this guy describing, like, man, the next thing I know, I'm in a baptismal tank getting baptized because I'm all in with Jesus. And, and, I, and I go down, I just realize I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. And if you're here and you've never turned to Jesus, turn to him now. Turn to him today. If you belong to him and you're feeling forgotten, I want to call you to take the psalm all the way through. Take the psalm all, read the psalm till the end. Because when you get to the end, it gets so good. 
But if you're here in auditorium A and you are not right with God in about one minute, I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance. And I just invite you to pray with me. If you're here in this room, if you're watching online and, and you know that you're not right with God, I'm going to invite you to believe in the righteousness of Jesus, to believe that he can take orphans and make them sons and daughters, to believe that you bring your sinful life to Jesus and it doesn't stay sinful anymore, that you bring your sinful record to Jesus and everything he touches changes and your sinful record becomes spotless because of what he did on the cross. Believe him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? answer? I haven't. Jesus came and he lost the sonship so you could get the sonship. He lost the favor so that you could get the favor. He lost the peace so that you could get the peace. So if you're here and you know you're not right with God, I want to invite you to bow your head with me right now. All of us bow our heads. And if you're watching right now and you're listening right now and you know that you need to turn to him, turn to the Lord right now. Believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved. Pray this with me. Say, dear God, take my heart and make me clean, change my life, forgive my sin, be the Lord of my life. Jesus, be my leader and forgiver, be my father, I am yours. Now just keep your heads bowed for a second. If today you are believing, if today you are turning to Jesus, I'm not gonna embarrass you but I do wanna know and I want our campus leaders to get ready right now. If, if today you are turning to him and you think that's happening inside of your heart, would you just put your hand up just right now? Just put your hand up if that's happening inside of you. Good. Who else? You say, that's happening to me. There's, there's life. There's a turning that's happening. If you're an auditorium man, that's happening. Just kind of put your hand up. And Dan Lee, you can take it from here and you guys can take it from here next door. And we're just going to close with prayer. And anyone that needs prayer, we're going to pray for any needs. So Pastor Robbie, I want you to come and close this in prayer. Our prayer team's going to come up here as well right now if you guys would make your way down. And we're just going to watch God do his wonders. Prayer partners, come on up. And if you would, stand with me all over the room. If you're joining us online, thank you for joining with us today. If you need someone to pray with you there with a the chat, you can go ahead and do that now. Hey, I want to encourage you. Um, I'm going to dismiss in just a second and uh, you're going to be, you know, you'll go to lunch and kind of life will go on sometimes. But if you, if, if God really spoke to you and, and you've made a shift this morning, you've made a turn from being an orphan to being adopted by God and you committed your life, we would love to pray with you. Pastor Mike wrote a book um, that's kind of helping you with your journey in Christ that we'd love to give you, pray for you, get you connected in a micro church or connected with a mentor of sorts to help you with your spiritual journey, kind of like some spiritual coaching of sorts. We would love to connect with you. So when everybody's leaving, make sure and come up here and receive prayer or even just connect with someone and say, hey, I'm going all in. Um, I'd love for some help help in this journey because listen, it was never meant to be journeyed alone. It's in the context of community. And that's why we have things called micro churches and these all throughout the week communities of people are meeting smaller communities of people. So I'm going to pray for us. I encourage you to get some prayer before you go. First time guests, make sure and see us in the tent. And then if you're coming to the connection lunch, please make sure and let us know. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you that we are not forgotten that you so loved us. You so loved the world. You so loved Robbie. You so loved us that you gave your only begotten son for us. You, you've communicated that you're for us and you're with us and we thank you. Now, Lord, help us to be missional this week and communicate to our world that you love them. Help us to be a light. Help us to be focused and encouraging to everyone around us, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, thanks for watching today. We really, really hope that today's message did something inside of your heart. All we're trying to do is help ordinary people become passionate followers of Jesus. Maybe you're watching this and you're from some other background, some other faith, some other religion. Maybe you've got questions. Maybe you need some prayer. You know what? We'd love to connect with you. So you might want to email or ask for prayer. Uh, just send us an email. We'd love to connect with you in that way. If you'd like to stay connected or you're interested in what some of those next steps for your life might be, perhaps you want to get baptized in water. Uh, maybe you've just got questions about some things of, of where your walk with God is going to go from here. We'd love to connect with you somehow. If you're anywhere in the southeast part of the United States, we'll find a way to get to you if you needed to. If you're interested in something like baptism, maybe you're interested in partnering up financially. I mean, we're literally trying to make a dent in this world with the things that we do. You are very welcome and invited to partner with us in some way and to become part of giving like that. Otherwise, I just pray God blesses you in Jesus' name. Amen.